Good evening and welcome to our continuing series Explorations in Savagery with our beloved Alokbai. On this day, November 17th, 45 years ago, mother left her physical body. For many of us, it was a deep physical blow. We obviously had not grown enough to understand that she had universalized herself, but we saw that small body lying there in the meditation hall, half crippled up because she could no longer lie flat. We had been in Bangalore collecting plants for the much money. Oh, you were in India at that time? Yes. Oh. And at five in the morning, someone shoved the newspaper under our door and the front cover was Mother Has Left. You mean on 18th November morning, 5 o'clock 17th, news? 17th. Yeah, but 17th they wouldn't have known. The newspaper of the 18th. Yeah. Oh. No, no, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. And so we came immediately and there were long lines mm. going around and around. We went around many, many, many times. Of course, I've read, I think, everything that was written about her passing. Nolini, Satprem. We listened to Pranab's talk in the playground and it was devastating to us. And Dr. Bisht also wrote very beautifully. So I think Dr. Bisht was the mother's physician, so to say. We, uh, we went around as many <coughs> times as we could. So, were you there? No, <laughs> and I think in a way it's a grace. I was just sharing this today with Anmol that, you know, people who were present um, with the mother in the physical body, of course, we also, I'm sure, were present but uh, in a previous life. Uh, so, they depended so much on the physical body and the bodily presence that they felt this deep shock. And those of us who have come later, who have grown up very, um, if I may say so, organically and naturally into the yoga, uh, we see this event very differently. Like I can share with you uh, my little experience that when I read uh, through the books, or everything I had read actually, and never this occurred to me that she meant to physically transform in this way that, you know, the whole body one day miraculously we'll see mm. a supramentalized mm. body. It never occurred to me because I read those statements that will take thousand years and a few hundred years you wait. So it was very obvious to me that this was not meant to be right now. And she asked Dr. Bisht and he said the body cannot do it anymore. Yeah, well Remember? Dr. Bisht had a very, uh, I, I know him very well uh, and he has shared many things. He had his own limited vision and the beauty is mother wanted somebody with a limited vision. Yeah. She said, I want somebody who can just tell me physically what is happening yes. Yes. and not look at it from the deeper yes. angle. And he didn't have that. That's the best part. Yes. But he had his own uh, deep connection with the mother. So, uh, by the way, he is the person who introduced um, the concept of spiritual health in WHO. Mm. So, yeah, how she has worked through and Jipmar, he, she gave the message. And so all this one side of the story, whosoever life she touched. So to someone like me and I am sure many others, this dilemma never came, this issue never came. And I remember on two occasions, one with Hutadi and once uh, someone else who said, you know, when mother was there. Hutadi once mentioned in front of me and somebody, when mother was there. And I spontaneously said, please don't say that. So I said, I mean, when you say was, it doesn't make any sense to us. Like she is so concrete and real and living. It never occurred to me that mother was and is not. But I can understand people who, in fact, when I came here, <laughs> I was very surprised when someone told me, you know, when mother was there, then things were different. 
I got it. It was it had jarring note. I've been coming for years, and you know, it never struck me that she's not here. But I, uh, I mean, so probably I think though they were very much physically dependent, and the Divine Mother wants us to progress inwardly enough. When Ravindra Ji was asked that was the yoga easy at that time, he said no, because uh, we largely dependent on her physical appearance. and she kept reminding that i am not this yes yes but those of you who have come later ravindra ji's words you find it so natural and spontaneous to seek her in the psychic through the psychic door and you are very fortunate yeah. and i 200% agree with him this coming generations will not have this conception of and they will understand very naturally that well it's going to take a few centuries i mean it's After all, a project of this nature. Yeah. So now, of course, uh, having read everything from agenda, and I have my own understanding, which I think we have shared on a different occasion. So that's how it is. <laughs> so we go back yeah. to Savitri, and in a way, it connects because um, we are reading the little mind. so um, shubindu uses you know there is the little mind and the greater mind and the fundamental difference is this that the little mind leans heavily upon matter it it is the mind which is embodied human beings embody because the power of the mind which is entered and it has created these three layers as it has evolved in matter with matter as basis so it's heavily dependent on the material senses and therefore its arc of vision or its movement is limited within the circle of matter and material realities and whatever it receives through the material senses that's why it is a little mind um and three layers which shobindra will reveal to us the physical mind and which is totally dependent on the physical senses the vital mind which takes flight of imagination but even its imagination it still draws data from whatever it has actually seen yes it cannot imagine something which it has never experienced still even if it sees a blue god it will still be blue as it has conceived it has experienced and then we have the rational mind which depends on pure analysis so these three are the little mind and why said it connects with the event of uh, 17 november how can our mind so limited by the senses can understand the mystery of god's birth in time to all our rational thought to all our analytical mind to all our physical senses she is no more but can we say with certainty either this way or that way as long as we are kept in the physical mind or the material mind the mind has to free itself from that and reclaim faculties of inspiration intuition revelation illumination to really know but on behalf of all those who touched mother's feet looked into her eyes i can understand exactly i loss. mean and shubindu himself said one moment of that physical touch is greater than a thousand subjective experiences so there is no doubt that the embodied divine and the mystery that manifestation is beyond comprehension yes at the same time at some point one has to get into the yes yeah one has to yes. discover her here yes. and start the so both yes. things yes. equally valid and who knows we we have uh, we may have been uh, in all likelihood after all we all have lived with her in many lives this is the mother statement so it's quite likely that we have experienced both and now we are experiencing this side yes. of the coin yes. <laughs> so we continue on page 241 even a greater miracle was done so even this little mind even here many things happen and can happen the mediating light linked bodies par the sleep and dreaming of the tree and plant the animals vibrant sense the thought in man 
to the effulgence of a ray above. Mm. Uh, this is very interesting that you know Shivindu used the word the dreaming of the tree and plant. Yeah. So surely what looks on the surface is not the whole truth of the matter. Uh, plants have their own consciousness, their own inner life. However, you know, limited it is. They aspire and mother has told us about sitting before the cherry blossom tree and she uh, gets the aspiration of the tree. And see, and the tree reveals the secret that, you know, the disorders of the spring can be healed by it. Yes. And also she sees that how it is aspiring for the Light, light to come back. Yes. So there is a subconscious life of the tree and the plant which we miss. And yet through this life, which is still a manifestation of the rudimentary mind, it tries to seek something higher up. So it is the mediating light. It is not uh, the soul in that sense, but through the, this little mind. And Sri Aurobindo speaks of uh, even a greater miracle. Yes. But that miracle... He says, doesn't really exist. <laughs> that, because there is a process. Yes. But even the animal's vibrant sense. How animals sense yes. the divinity? Yes. I mean, uh, this famous donkey, how he would respond to mother's force, the bullock, so many of the animals. So the crow, I, one the can crow. understand the donkey and the bullock, still a quadruped. At least it's a mammal. But, but look at the crow, a bird. And this bird called Blackie um, would take food from mother's hand and one day she didn't come out. And when Champaglal came and gave the crow food, it refused to eat. How does a crow sense yeah. Yeah. that, no, I want only her? Of course, Champaglal ji could be very intimidating in his presence. <laughs> sure. The crow didn't run away. It just didn't eat. <laughs> so... Its skill endorsing matters right to think. Cuts sentient passages for the mind of flesh. Mm. And found a means for nescience to know. Mind of flesh. So the brain. So through the brain we see so many gairai and salkai which have evolved over millenniums. And it has cut these passages for the greater light to express it it shaped the instrument meaning thereby it is consciousness that shapes the instrument because the little mind has to manifest a reason has to manifest and though it manifests even in the crow and the you know uh, even in the spider in some way rudimentary reason even in the plant but to really express itself the uh, bodily instrument has to be shaped so it shapes cuts sentient passages so evolution is First, consciousness changes, then it puts a pressure on the bodily self and then the body undergoes a change. And this is a two-step process. Do you agree that only 10% of the brain is used? Well, that's what they say and um, percentage is difficult, but there are there, there is a little catch to it. Um, it means that the brain is static and there is 90% to be used. But my personal understanding is that brain, like every other part, is evolving. Now, because this little change of thought changes everything. If it is evolving, then you can play with it. It's an organ, you know, in, in fact, this concept has come now and the concept is neuroplasticity. So it means that when you have a stroke, a particular area of the brain goes away. And so you can't function. You can't speak, for example, if the speech area is grown. But there are other areas of the brain which can take up the function and can, you know, start functioning. This is called neuroplasticity. So the brain is evolving. We see even now, you know, Desiree, we have someone who lost the speech and his speech has almost come back. Did you see her video? Yes. Yeah. Then we had this famous um, light, the Desiree house she used to live. And when she had a paralytic stroke, uh, one day she saw in the dream... Mother comes to her. She is looking at the picture and mother comes to her and it's a dream vision. And uh, mother gives her something to eat, like a prashad, as if she comes out of the picture. And she says, I can't take it because I must take it uh, with my other hand. So she starts putting the 
whatever paralyzed hand was there, the other hand, the healthy hand. Mother says, no, no, with, the, with that hand. And she says, I can't. It's paralyzed. Mother says, you try. So in that experience, she tries with great difficulty and she eventually takes it. Then she took it as an indication and every day she would do this little exercise. With the other healthy hand, she would lift the other hand as if she is feeding something oh. to the mother. And she recovered her function fully. So you see, there is um, a constant change. So it's true that there is a lot of areas of the brain unused, but it's also true that new areas are coming into play. And scientists are discovering it, which is amazing. Because ultimately, even when intuition manifests through the physical, it has to have some kind of a instrument, readiness. Yes. So uh, this is a big conundrum because, you know, people often uh, say that it's the brain which, uh, which is the, because of which there is consciousness. But here it's the other way around. It is consciousness that shapes the instrument. And mother says that uh, even in a coma, the yes, mind is still yes, growing. That, that is... Uh, they have done research. I have been there actually to the faculty in Nimans where they oh. do consciousness research. And they actually found that even when somebody is in coma uh, and you say something, see people forget that in coma your ears are still open, your touch is, you don't know what's happening inside. And when they said certain words, the certain areas of the brain responded. So they concluded yes. that and that's why I keep telling people that when somebody is in coma, don't think that he's already dead. There is a difference between the two. So go and touch. Maybe, you know, say gently into the ears that everything is fine. Or just that, you know, we love you. We are grateful for all you have done. So it helps because there are other means through which communication goes. And it has been registered now that yes, something does get registered. Because there are, you know, instruments like yes. that. Now he speaks about language. It's very interesting to look at language this way. Mm -hmm. Offering, now, you know, he has spoken of, the, gives a means for nescience to know. So how do we get to know things? We use speech, language, thought. That's how we become aware. Uh, somebody is very restless. One doesn't know why one is restless. Then it takes the form of a thought. I want to eat this. That's my desire. It takes a form. It takes the form of a language, a body of words. So language evolved essentially to express what's happening inside in terms of consciousness. It gives a form. So here he is saying, offering its little squares and cubes of word as figured substitutes for reality. Now this I feel is so important because in, in this whole few lines that follow, that we should not think the word is the reality. When mother was asked that, what is it that you put into your words, which makes it so powerful that when we read it, it awakens us. The same thing if somebody else says, sometimes mother's one-liners, yeah. learn to live within. Now, you know, anybody can say it, but when you read it from the mother, it's like it hits you. Now, what is it? She was asked, this is a long question. Mother's reply is one word consciousness so words are a means to touch the consciousness and not to get lost in the external meaning that's why Shobindo, though there is a whole um, uh, essay on the word of the scripture where he says many people they get lost in the external maze word meaning whereas actually you have to touch the essence which is consciousness so here he is explaining that that it's a substitute for reality Substitute can never be the reality. Right. It may be a good substitute or a bad substitute. A mummified mnemonic alphabet. Wow. Look at it. It helped the unseen force to read her works. Mnemonic. It's like uh, a string of words which are used like a memory peg to remind us of something else. So when we use the word, it's just like a mnemonic, mummified, like, you know, Krishna, Krishna. Now, you know, people say Krishna, Krishna. But when Draupadi says Krishna, Krishna manifests, it's so interesting. <laughs> because he puts that thing in the word, which may be missing. So otherwise, it's nothing but a mummified mnemonic. You are saying Krishna, but you are not remembering the being, the power, the force, 
you are just saying mechanically and she says that's what the difference in a mechanical mantra and a mantra which to which you add from the heart so otherwise it's a mummified look at the word not just man mnemonic mummified means it's like a rigid something rigid dead it helped the unseen force to read her works a buried consciousness arose in her and now she dreams herself human and awake because of this language it's all and mother says at one place you know what human being thinks they are very superior because they can express what do you know animals can't express in their speech they can't give beautiful speeches so you think that they are not feeling they are feeling they are feeling more than human beings but they can't express so you know don't think that because they can't express they don't feel they feel more the sense of superiority because we can express so we become human because now we can give a form but all was still a mobile ignorance that's why mm. words which are meant to throw a bridge between two consciousnesses becomes a means to cut the bridge between two people because that's how you know <laughs> we get lost in the words we don't touch what is yeah. behind yeah. so often we hear people saying this is not what i meant you have got me wrong mm -hmm. you yeah. got me wrong because you saw my words and you did not see the heart which is behind it's a whole world of understanding still knowledge could not come and firmly grasp this huge invention seen as a universe oh. so there is a word for everything and there is a specific meaning and yet it cannot grasp the reality because what is behind is ineffable you cannot describe it the moment you describe it you lose it it's beyond words beyond words precisely because words will uh, cut a section then another section and try to put them together but the reality is not like that that's why mother says that you know supramental speech is not yet come you cannot describe the supramental experience because words cannot convey they are used to three dimensional and at most plus time dimension they cannot convey savitri is the closest savitri is the closest that's right and even there shubhendra says it's not yeah. yet supramental yeah. speech a specialist of logic's hard machine imposed its rigid artifice on the soul and aid of the inventor intellect it cut truth into manageable bits this is exactly what we were saying yeah, yeah. so when we were uh, there is a joke about it uh, we'll read this passage then i'll tell you there is a very interesting joke that each might have his ration of thought food <laughs> then new built truths slain body by its art so when we joined the medical college you know some of us came from a religious background some traditional some others atheist so there used to be the joke and some of those who didn't believe in you know soul or god are we are cutting the dead body every day where is the soul so i had a funny answer to this i said yeah because it's dead the soul is left <laughs> that's my <laughs> childish answer i said logically logically it is said that when the body is dead the soul leaves so obviously if you cut the dead body you won't find cut a living body and see then you will see whether soul is there or not but of course this was a very childish answer i wouldn't dare to give that answer but something much more uh, you know now if somebody asks it i am reminded of sami ramtirth when he was asked after a big lecture so so you are saying you mean to say that uh, you have a soul so he says no i am not saying that i have a soul what do you what are you saying all this while he says i am a soul i have a body so the perspective changes so it says that it reconstitute by slaying that's why even the word integral integral world is not body plus life plus mind plus soul because then you are cutting into bits and showing them each as something different and then you make a very rigid thing but all the time in a dynamic sense there is an inflowing and an outflowing and a constant the soul flows into yes. the body its substance it gives to the body a sweetness a lightness because it's not that okay soul is there and this is the body 
and similarly the body's inertia can cloud the soul it's it's like that and now see how futuristic shurbindo is a robo exact and serviceable and false how punch line you know today we are talking of artificial intelligence and uh, that was my take on it someone asked me i said artificial intelligence is all all right that's a project those who are interested let them work on it my interest is in divine intelligence how human beings can evolve their intelligence toward divinity but if we don't evolve when the robots come into play then i i say kasibo may be quite right that <laughs> the rise of the machines so we need to evolve our spiritual intelli or rather a mentalized intelligence into a spiritual and a divine intelligence then robots are okay but then you will rule them otherwise they will begin to rule you like any other machine so he speaks of it that it is a robo exact and serviceable and false false displays the spirit's finer view of things oh the other day i was watching a video where somebody is saying what may happen 20 years 30 years down the line and projects that there would be artificial intelligence so you don't need to go to the doctor doctors will become jobless all right logically correct and many doctors are i won't uh, uh, i would agree that you know they are worse than robots i don't deny but then what you will miss is the healing touch people don't go to doctors as a mechanical machine that you feed in the data and he comes out with the prescription that yes the robot can do but who is going to say that don't worry you'll be fine probably the robot will be very blunt and say you got cancer malignancy last stage please sign make it will last will and be done with it i give you 3 months that's the end of the story and after that if the man says really well 3 months that's how the robot will repeat but a doctor wouldn't say that he would say well my science is imperfect who knows you must keep your will alive maybe celebrate every day of your life even if you have 3 months or 3 days so this is where the human touch comes in so he is with his own sense of humor displays the spirit's finer view of things which looks beyond the physical surface of things a polished engine did the work of a god it's perfect yeah but it's false by its very perfection you know when shubindu spoke that aphorism of europe i'm waiting for europe to perfect its machinery and then a child will destroy it and mother didn't comment on it so it's oh. very powerful and if you look at it one way to understand who is this child the child of the new creation yes the soul which yes. plays with it it because how many issues will you try to solve one issue with logic another will come up it's standing round the corner none the true body found its soul seemed dead none had the inner look which sees truth soul mm. all glory fight the glittering substitute so even the true body we don't know this gross body is not the true body we can take the true body in the form of the subtle body the inner body is and the soul itself so none could find it and they the glittering substitute the outer shell now because this has happened there is another power that emerges then from the secret heights a wave swept down now again you see before the emergence from within there is a pressure of the consciousness from above a power is sent by the higher states to enter into matter and awaken it because otherwise it's uh, getting locked into a very small movement the involution involution this is more than involution it's now already there is an involution of these layers but there is that level which is already involved corresponding to that the power comes and presses upon matter to bring out like super mind is already involved so when mother and shubindo come holding the super mind and now there is the supramental manifestation it will bring out that which is already within so this power sweeps down this power actually imagination is the formative maya which in human beings turns into imagination imagination gives forms and see it is a greater reality look at you know 
uh, virtual reality shows those who have attended it's amazing you know it's not real and yet you go through all the experiences you really feel and you keep reminding it's not real you look around and you say it's not real and still your body your mind everything is reacting it's so strange have you done this thing with the glasses yeah yeah i know oh i have two three places and recently i had the experience of the 12d where you also they also give those water and uh, smells etc and um, in this 12d they took through a, a very fast ride hmm. now it was is experiment few minutes maybe 5 minutes hmm. but mind boggling it like goes up down and you actually experience that well it's going to go down fall down and you keep reminding it's not happening it's not happening and yet your body and something in the mind react till you reach a point where you have to completely separate so i had done it to basically practice this once again in this way because otherwise in normal life it's easy to you know separate because you have time here it's like something which is so fast it's amazing so 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 this power comes in from above this is the power of imagination it's the same power which god brahman uses maya which gives the sense of a reality uh, in bits and parts so that power in human beings turns into imagination it's a formative power so if you imagine a ghost well whether ghost is there or not is not the issue but you start experiencing so if human beings know how to use this power it can open the path that's how very often people say oh but you are imagining there is god fine it's a power given to you start with imagination yes. you will end up with reality you will anyways imagine something if you imagine there is no god you will end up discovering that there is no god strange because it's a formative power so this is the power that comes and how beautifully she describes uh, he describes then from the secret heights a wave swept down a brilliant chaos of rebel light arose it wants to break free from this gluing to matter mm. it looked above and saw the dazzling peaks it does not know what's hidden but it feels that there is something beyond which is hidden it looked within and woke the sleeping god it just you know <gasps> there is god inside and it woke up imagination called her shining squads that venture into undiscovered scenes where all the marvels lurk none yet has known that's why you see this nowadays you have comics and television shows on mahabharata and ramayana and many such thing now i didn't grow up on that because they had not yet come into full swing so i just read Or people often ask that isn't uh, how is it? I said no, this is not better. The one the one where it was not illustrated was better. They asked why. I said I had my own picture of Krishna, yeah. which my mind had developed. I had my own image of Arjuna, but now when you have the illustration, I have to fix my mind onto the image which somebody yes. else has yes. created. I don't want that, and I can tell you till date that image remains. same when we were children yeah exactly everything we had to listen to or read yes now you have this so you think it has become more convenient but you have snatched the faculty of imagination yes and the power yes. of imagination yes. lifting her beautiful and miraculous head she conspired with inspiration sister brood <laughs> so shining squads of imagination and sister brood of inspiration they come together to fill thought skies with glimmering nebula some light points suddenly began to appear this is the early age of mankind lived on this the age of the myths when reason had not come a bright error frames the mystery alters freeze darkness grew nurse to wisdom's occult sun so within this realm of darkness some light came and this freeze like a border you know you you put something on a wall like a wallpaper but which blends so well it looks like you know the real wall so it's not 
the real thing but yet it's like a border through which you can feel the touch of something greater something higher myth suckle knowledge with a lustrous milk so you know that's why i feel one of the things that today's children are missing is myths and jung jungian psychology you know the swiss yes, psychologist yes. he said that those who have grown up on myths strangely develop a very um, their intelligence is more developed and can work in many ways it gives them a kind of resilience when they face life than those who were just brought up on hard facts so now it's very unfortunate that we have very little myths yeah. there are they are there but even i have met parents who feel they should not tell myths because it's like cutting the child away from reality so i had once a parent who said but i have not taught about hanuman stories and all i said why said because you know he has to face reality i said how do you know that you have not blocked him from a deeper reality you have snatched away his possibilities potentials his aspiration to one day fly and catch the sun the deeper arts psychic cards to serve the lord you have just snatched away everything and given him what substitute this so called hard reality as if this is the only reality and every country has grown up with myths yes and in india it's a land of myths you you hear myths from every for everything there is a myth <laughs> you know we have so many festivals people don't realize for every festival there is a story <laughs> other day we were sharing the story of baiduj <laughs> and it's amazing all these stories rakhi there is a story everything ekadashi there will be a story and it's not about whether these stories are physically feasible or real or not but they give you something deeper and profound the infant passed from dim to radiant breast so he is saying you know imagination brings some kind of a light thus worked the power upon the growing world its subtle craft withheld the full orbed blaze cherished the soul's childhood and on fictions fed far richer in their sweet and nectarous sap nursing its immature divinity than the staple or dry straw of reason's tilt <laughs> tilt do you know that soil when you the first uh, things which grow on that dry straw of reason's tilt he says it looks fiction yes it's it, it you know you have to be too foolish to believe that actually monkey was speaking in a you know human language or the the bear was you know um, speaking in a human language or monkey was flying he, he, obviously it's obvious the story is not true in a physical sense and if you start taking like that that krishna was actually blue in color when he was on earth or shiva is holding a serpent all the time a very inconvenient serpent so to say you know obviously you, you are fooling yourself but if you look at the symbol it gives you a far richer truth you know one line since we are at ramayana you know and people often do you really believe ramayana existed how can monkey speak i said that's not the issue ramayana is not trying to prove a point that monkey spoke but look at what ramayana is saying is there an animal type of humanity yes is there a bear kind of humanity yes is there a fallen humanity yes look what ramayana is teaching us the first seeds of socialism in one line it is captured and the line goes like this ganika is talking about the lord rama गणिका अजामिल ब्याद गीद गजाद खल तारे गणा लुक एट द ग्रेस ऑफ द लॉर्ड गणिका द नॉच गर्ल अजामिल द सिनर ब्याद द बुचर द हंटर गीद द वल्चर जटायु एंड संपाद यू नो वल्चर्स आर सपोज टू बी द वर्स्ट क्रीचर्स बिकॉज द ईट द स्केवेंजर्स द एलिफेंट the monkey they are all liberated by the lord meaning thereby i surely have hope <laughs> i mean all of us look at the profound message you are lost in whether you know monkey spoke or not obviously that's either you believe that somebody who wrote the ramayana with such a beauty of language and meter and subtlety of emotions was it outright fool to you know put it either you believe in which case he wouldn't have written such a profound scriptures which continues to influence the mind of the race for centuries or you take it that obviously like 
I give the modern analogy, George Orwell's Animal Farm. So mm. when you read Animal Farm, you don't say that this is not real. It's a point which is being conveyed. Alice in Wonderland. It's not about reality. It conveys a point. So it's not whether Ramayana existed or not existed. That's a different debate altogether. But look at the profundity of you know what it's yes. feeding us with. The thoughts of socialism, where even the animal is not left an outcast. The socialism as we practice today is very human centric, which means that human beings can come together and destroy the animal life because well for humans, which is very dangerous. That's not socialism, but the socialism of a spiritual kind is where even the fallen, the animal, the the lowest of the lowly creature is part of that. Of course, for me, Rama and Krishna exist as a psychological reality, spiritual reality. But that's a different debate. But just look at the myth, and Shobindu that famous aphorism where he says that men wonder whether the gospel and the stories of Rinda one whether they existed or not. Then he says that let them dispute. This is a beautiful aphorism, not exact word, but he says thanks for the gospel and the forgeries, they save mankind alive. So beautiful lines these are. It's heaped fodder of innumerable facts, plebeian fare on which today we thrive. You know, plebeian fare is like. The common markets, you know, mm -hmm. in old time we used to have. I think in US also uh, they have these in countryside those fairs. Oh, yes. In India we used to. Now you, everybody goes to fair, but what do you get? Those common cheap items. Yes. <laughs> so it's the same thing. Innumerable facts. So people go to fair because there are a lot of things there, but they are all worthless. You you're just you know okay fine let me pick up something. So innumerable facts, but none of them is of any significance or worth. Thus stream down from the realm of early light, ethereal thinkings into matter's world. Its gold horned herds trooped into earth's cave heart. Gold horned. In Yagnavalka story it comes. Horns, inconscient. Still there is a touch of the higher light. So Shubhinda says gold horned. How beautifully, you know, herds. Trooped into earth's cave heart. They are coming directly. They are bypassing all this logical mind. Its morning rays illume our twilight's eyes. Its young formations move the mind of earth in the typal age of mankind. To labor and to dream and new create. New create. Because then you can dream that one day I can fly like Hanuman. Then you can dream to be noble as Rama. To be virtuous and enduring and strong as Sita. But that's how you can dream. Otherwise, if you see reality, you will see it's an impossibility. Yeah. Savitri itself is that. You can conquer death. To feel beauty's touch and know the world and self, the golden child began to think and see. So golden child is obviously the truth soul which has entered into matter and now it is emerging out. So as it emerges, it begins to think and see, even though it is yet to develop its deeper eyes. So we'll stop here.